Excellent. All right, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Hazen Russell to present our next talk. And Hazen, I think you can go ahead whenever you're ready. I just have to share your screen. Terrific, thanks very much, Kayla. I think you should see my screen, right? Yes, we are seeing it, Hazen. Great, thanks. So um, great to follow on Ken, who was presenting under some adverse conditions of no power and and uh, throwing up his uh, image uh, via cell data coverage. So uh, things are a little easier for me in Ottawa. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, how Canada One Water supports multi-scale transboundary groundwater surface water studies. Um, and uh, it's a subject particularly pertinent for Ontario, who has the largest amount of transboundary watersheds in Canada, uh, and actually nearly represents half of the total transboundary watersheds uh, or area between Canada and the United States. Uh, before moving on, just to acknowledge my coworkers, um, so uh, Stephen Fry and Omar Kadar and uh, Mr. Azu uh, from Aquante University or Aquante Incorporated in Waterloo, and Melissa Bunn, who's at the Geological Survey of Canada. And let's see if I can move forward. Here we go. Uh, so uh, you heard Steve talk about Canada One Water on Tuesday, and uh, he flashed this uh, slide of the participants in the project, and I'd just like to acknowledge. Uh, the broader team that's uh, making Canada One Water possible from Aquante, uh, the Government of Canada, and from Academia, of U of T, and, uh, and Waterloo. Uh, and specifically for the Rainy uh, River uh, work, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Kasav and Matt uh, for the GIS and uh, calibration work on the numeric model. Uh, and for funding the Rainy River portion of this presentation, the International Joint Commission, Canada One Water, and the Groundwater Geoscience Program. Uh, so just to frame this then within the international context, uh, you're probably familiar with the International Joint Commission. So a binational uh, committee uh, between the United States and Canada concerned about uh, transboundary watersheds and as you're familiar water is a provincial responsibility uh, in Canada and it only rises to a federal responsibility in the case of, of federal lands, uh, navigable waters, uh, some fisheries and um, transboundary watersheds. Um, so that's the focus of, uh, of this talk today uh, and particularly uh, with respect to increasing concerns over environmental assessments, cumulative effects, uh, and uh, and with this increasing demand on water, the need to really be able to support environmental flows. Um, so just to set up a bit of a rationale for the rest of the talk then, um, you know, what are some of the issues uh, concerning transboundary waters uh, and, and what Canada does or does not have? And we currently lack a uniform national framework to address uh, transboundary groundwater and surface water issues. Uh, we that That's manifested in a number of different manners. Um, one is uh, a lack of consolidated, harmonized and parameterized data uh, across all of the jurisdictions in the country and with the United States. Um, we have no hydraulic uh, modeling framework for these watersheds, uh, neither for groundwater or groundwater surface water interaction understanding, and, and no framework to really understand climate change scenarios on these watersheds. And, and Consequently, we lack an adaptive modeling protocol. So how can we economize and, and improve the opportunities for people to uh, look at various modeling scenarios? And, and one of the challenges is the, particularly the lack of consolidated harmonized uh, data. Uh, so when we say transboundary watersheds, what are we talking about? In this case, we're looking at watersheds defined at a fourth order uh, stream network scale. There's approximately 61 of them. That includes actual watersheds based just on lakes. Um, 
they uh, encompass a total area of, of just over or you know, 2,350,000 kilometers, and they're slightly skewed in distribution in favor of the United States because of um, the extensive number of watersheds in the Southern Great Lakes watersheds. Uh, and, and as alluded to earlier, uh, the Great Lakes uh, drainage basin comprises the vast uh, or the largest portion of that total area at 750,000 square kilometers. And a quick breakdown on, on sort of the, the distribution of watershed scales there uh, from min to max and an average there. Um, and we'll be talking about the Rainy River watershed, um, which is in the red circle there, number 21. It's about 84,000 square kilometers. Um, and this is just a list of illustrative issues that impact transboundary watersheds. And, and on Tuesday, you heard people talking about um, road salting and effects of, of road salt on salinization of, of groundwater and surface water resources. And, and clearly that's a, a significant issue uh, in urbanized uh, watersheds. Uh, in Rainy River, mining is a major concern. Um, and likewise in, in southern British Columbia. And the pie diagram just shows the percentage of some of these issues that impact uh, watersheds. So about 51% of the watersheds have agricultural uh, activity, 42% uh, of the mining activity. These are very cursory, uh, inaccurate figures, but just provide some sense of, of the distribution of impacts across watersheds. Um, and the transboundary challenge from a groundwater perspective has been that the Geological Survey of Canada was very much focused on uh, characterization of aquifers. Um, and um, aqu aquifer work is really compromised or constrained by uh, the sparse data on aquifers, the quality and quantity of that data and its high variability particularly across the number of jurisdictions that come into play here, which is around 24 when you take state, provincial, and federal uh, jurisdictions. Um, and, uh, and consequently, uh, harmonization of data is, is difficult across um, you know, this range of jurisdictions. Um, moving away from aquifers, there's a, a, an editorial piece, I believe, uh, the 2021 article uh, referenced here by Rivera was in groundwater, but I could be mistaken. And, and it raised the question as to whether transboundary water should be managed on an aquifer basis or on a flow system basis. Um, and given the challenges of mapping aquifers across the diversity, diverse range of jurisdictions and geological conditions and data support, Canada One Water really is going to address this from a flow system or, or just groundwater system perspective. Uh, and that will help uh, allow us to really deal with aquifers where very few people live. Some watersheds have as few as 240 residents uh, versus the Great Lakes uh, where you, know, you have up to 50 million people and a single watershed can have seven to eight million people in it. Um, so a commensurate increase in data availability. Um, and we initially trialed uh, this approach in Southern Ontario, and some of you may be familiar with the, the Southern Ontario Paleozoic bedrock model that was developed and the physically based numeric model that was developed uh, on top of that, and which is also being used by MECP uh, to look at some of this, the watersheds in, in Ontario. Um, so that's going to bring us to Canada One Water and uh, its support for transboundary watersheds and, and some of the aspects of the Rainy River work. And Canada One Water is, is as identified or, or you know, discussed by Steve on Tuesday, is a attempting to model the entire water balance or budget of Canada water cycle. Uh, it's using three different domains for climate modeling, downscaling from global to regional, the weather uh, research forecasting model, to couple that climatic data uh, with the groundwater surface water modeling when you're using the community land model, 
And then hydrogeosphere is being implemented for uh, groundwater surface water modeling. And uh, to, we're, from a physical domain perspective, we've divided Canada into seven domains, and three of those domains are important from transboundary watershed, specific the Nelson River and the Great Lakes Atlantic. Um, and we've assembled a uniform, harmonized, and parameterized data set for all of Canada that supports each one of these seven uh, domain models. Uh, and I'm not, Steve talked about this data on Tuesday, so I'm not going to get into the details here on, on those data sets. Uh, and that brings us to Rainy River, uh, Lake of the Woods watershed in Western Ontario. It's the second largest transboundary watershed in uh, Ontario, uh, if you consider all of the Great Lakes as one. Um, it's 84,000 square kilometers, uh, somewhat skewed on the Canadian side, 5524 for the American side. And you see this DEM, you see that it rises uh, in the east and drains towards the west and, and eventually to Lake Winnipeg. Uh, here's just a quick snapshot of the drainage network at second order streams and greater and how we've discretized the mesh on the right-hand side. Um, and we've managed to capture uh, lakes greater than 10 square kilometers, which is about 70% of the total lakes. And as a percentage of the total watershed, 16% uh, of the watershed is uh, water surface. Uh, and greater than 10 square kilometers is 11% of the total watershed. Um, and the mesh is discretized, is uh, irregular in dimension or varies in, in, in scale uh, and is finest along streams, lake shores, and then coarsens into inner lake areas. Uh, and uh, we've also uh, integrated a number of mine sites for illustrative purposes. This model has in, in a single layer around 85,000 uh, triangular nodes, uh, which is somewhere around 30% or 30 times more than the Canada One water model for the same watershed area. This is the hydrostratigraphy we're invoking in, uh, two layers for soils, uh, three layers for the superficial geology and three layers for bedrock. And you can see on the left-hand side, of the diagram in a slightly more complicated form, the number of, or the heterogeneity that's imparted within each of the layers. So the topsoil layer, for example, has 15 zones uh, that represent different soil types and consequently different hydraulic conductivity values, et cetera. Um, we're currently in the process of calibrating this model, and that's proving to be no small challenge. You can see on the left the total number of, of river gauging stations, and the larger diagram with the red triangles highlights the stations with adequate long-term records to use for calibration, and there are also natural flows. Much of the river watershed has control structures, uh, which render uh, much of the monitoring data uh, not useful for calibration purposes for this, this model. Um, I guess a notable point here is the, the very rich wealth of monitoring data for stream flows in the United States versus the rather sparse distribution in Canada. Uh, this is an illustrative uh, gauge for um, the numeric model with observations in red, simulation in blue. It's for a 20 year period of this um, uh, numeric model. Uh, and you can see we're getting quite good uh, seasonal uh, correlations and amplitudes. Uh, the Nash Sutcliffe uh, values there uh, in the top right corner is 0.5 and uh, a percent bias of 4.5. Um, so we're narrowing in on, on um, you know, what we would like to see from a calibration perspective. Um, so moving to an application and wrapping up in the next couple of slides, then uh, 
critical minerals is a rising issue in the country and a, a considerable concern for a lot of, uh, of uh, rural areas in terms of mining activity. And what you see on the left is a prospectivity model for Canada uh, for a specific mineral uh, element. Um, I, I believe this one is nickel. Uh, and uh, Rainy Rivers highlighted in the red box there. And then uh, the model discretization is in the middle. And the right hand diagram simply shows a, a mine site with a highly discretized value. So some real value in uh, groundwater modeling to better understand ESG risks with respect to exploration and mining as we move forward uh, and the ability to look at that at different scales. Uh, so a broad range of community support uh, is, can be provided from this modeling initiative. Uh, and uh, just to summarize and wrap up then, uh, where Canada One Water provides a harmonized uniform data coverage for Canada, uh, the models model ready layers, whether you're using HGS fee flow or mod flow or some surface water modeling. Um, Canada One Water will be able to generate synoptic model results for re at a regional scale. Um, and we're able to um, rapidly spin off and develop nested models such as Rainy River. Um, obviously, we have a continued data improvement need um, and everything will be available under an open access data license uh, for other users. And we're currently, as Eric Boisvert alluded to, in a proposal um, call process at the moment, uh, hoping to be funded for phase two in April, but we'll have to wait and see how that develops in March. Uh, and thank you very much. If you want more information on Canada One Water, you can find it at one of these publications through the Canada One Water website. And if I have any time, I'm happy to take questions. That's great. Thanks, Hazen. Uh, yeah, we definitely have some time and maybe I'll just uh, remind for the people who are who've joined us since the opening. Uh, we do have time set aside today for for taking questions. So the way to submit your questions would be to click on the uh, in within Microsoft Teams. Just click on that little Q&A bubble. Looks like a little chat bubble with the question mark. Just click up on there, uh, submit your question, and then we'll we'll read it out live. We'll try to get that to as many as we can live. And then if not, presenters are available to uh, respond by text replies. So. Um, with that, I'm seeing one question come in here, Hazen, um, from George. With the increase, with the increase in interest in uranium, do you have, do you have studies? Uh, sorry, I'm just. Uh, have you studied the occurrence of uranium in groundwater? Uh, no, um, that's a bit outside of the scope of Canada One Water. Actually, we're a water quantity modeling and natural flows modeling initiative rather than water quality. Um, so I would have to pass that off to someone else. All right, thanks. I don't know if there's any other presenters who could answer to that at this time. And if so, feel free to jump on. No bites. <laughs> All right, well, hopefully that it answers. raises a good question, I guess, you, you know. Um, yeah. A lot of mineral exploration in Canada has been very focused on till sampling or the sampling of lake sediments. Uh, and there's an increasing interest in the use of groundwater for mineral exploration. And, and that's one good example. And that might be one avenue of finding data on uranium occurrence in groundwater. Um, yeah, yeah, good, good tip there. Um, um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in right now, Hazen, but again, we'll have some time uh, just before the break. So uh, if you don't mind sticking around and uh, if any other questions come up, I'll invite you back. 